Hi, I'm Darren Peppard. Welcome to the Leaning into Leadership podcast, the podcast dedicated to today's hardworking leader. Join me every Sunday for leadership insight, inspiration, and a little pep talk to keep you rolling down your road to awesome. Hello and welcome everybody into episode number 49 of the Leaning into Leadership podcast. I'm really excited today to share the conversation I had with our guest on the show. Our guest is Mike Alpert, and you might wonder who Mike Alpert is. Well, let me tell you. Mike is the guy who founded Peer Driven PD back in 2019, and he had a goal of bringing streamlined private sector solutions to public education. Mike's corporate experience as a project analyst for an international renewable energy firm and as a financial services specialist led him to realize just how important education is across all fields. Mike earned his MBA at Portland State University with focused coursework in finance and innovation management. And he then took that expertise to the classroom and the front office, where he worked for over the next decade as a middle school humanities teacher before becoming a building administrator. Mike is a Crystal Apple award-winning educator and has worked in both small rural districts and large suburban districts in the Portland metro area. And he even served overseas as a teacher and central administrator in Prague in the Czech Republic. Mike also is a founding board member of Ex Novo Brewing Company, a benefit corporation donating all of their net proceeds to charitable organizations. On his quote, off days, ha, insert joke here, educators, you can find him training for his next half marathon or hanging out at home with his wife and their son. I'm excited to share this conversation that I had with Mike Alpert with you, and we're going to do that right on the other side of these messages. Hey leaders, let me tell you a story. It's the story of my first year as a high school principal. I will tell you, I was exhausted, I was overwhelmed, and I lived my life breathing through a snorkel because my head was so far underwater and I didn't think there was a way out. I mean, I was a mess. The 40 feet that it was to move from my assistant principal office down to the principal's office might as well have been a 400 mile trek. I was just absolutely putting in crazy hours. I was trying to do it all. Like trying to answer everybody's question. Thinking I always had to be the smartest one in the room and I had to solve everybody's problems. We're talking severe Superman syndrome here, folks. Every day was fire after fire, and all I accomplished was putting out fires. Forget about leading. I was simply trying to survive. Now, after working with a leadership coach, I really was able to get things figured out, get my head from being a firefighter to actually being a leader. But it took work, and I discovered some things that really mattered. And that's why I've created Walk in Your Purpose, Five Mindsets to Level Up Your Leadership, a free ebook that you can have today at no cost. Just go to walkinyourpurpose.roadtoawesome.net backslash ebook to download your free copy. Again, that's walkinyourpurpose.roadtoawesome.net backslash ebook. It's time for you to walk in your purpose, to find joy in your job, and to be the leader you always knew that you could be. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. Explore more podcasts at www.teachbetterpodcastnetwork.com. Now let's get on to the episode. Well, if you've ever wondered what exactly goes into preparing professional development for teachers in bite-sized little chunks, giving them the ability to do that on your own, here is your opportunity to learn more. Mike Alpert joining the show today. Mike, welcome in. Thanks so much for joining me, man. Thanks a lot, Darren. It's an honor to be here. I appreciate the time. Yeah, absolutely. So before we dive in, just really quick, I already kind of threw a teaser in there, but just really quick, maybe share with my listeners who you are and what it is that you do, maybe where you're coming from too. Sure. Yeah. So 
Uh, Mike Alpert, I, uh, I live in uh, a little town called uh, Newburgh, Oregon. So we're about 45 minutes south of Portland in wine country, Willamette Valley. It's really, really beautiful. Um, and, you know, my career has spanned the public and private sectors. These days, I like to consider myself kind of in both, kind of have a, a foot in both, both areas. But uh, I started, um, started as an accountant um and made my way uh to being a middle school teacher which is a interesting transition and, and um yeah there's quite a story there and uh, i also became a middle school building administrator and about three years ago i started this company peer driven pd so now uh, I'm, I'm founder of a of a professional development company that we're trying to do things a little bit differently um but the the huge benefit to this transition is that today I get to spend pretty much all my time um, working with amazing teachers, working with amazing administrators. Um, so I have all the upside of, of being in a building without some of the stress. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm loving life and loving what we're doing. I think that's fantastic. And, you know, you just you hit on two things that I want I want to go after here. Well, really three. But one, you're absolutely right. When when you have that opportunity to come in and work with the teachers and, and be around students, you know, and support support teachers, support administrators. It's an incredible thing. And yes, being able to walk away and not have to be the one to deal with the angry parent or, you know, any of those kinds of things. So listeners, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to trying to call out all the all the bad things, the the unfortunate things that are a part of the job. But uh, Mike, you're right. That is nice to be able to do that. You know, you said something. Um, I, I want to chase the transition from accountant to middle school teacher here here in just a minute. But for those who don't know, I typically will pre meet with my guests. You know, for 20, 30 minutes just to get to know them, and then schedule another time for the recording, which is something Mike that you and I did. But when we did that, you didn't mention that you were in Newburgh, Oregon. I don't know how I missed that piece, but one of my good friends is one of the assistant principals at Newburgh High School, a guy named Mark Brown. I don't know if you know Mark, but uh, Mark is an incredible guy. So shout out to Newburgh, Oregon. Yeah, Mark, I think Mark lives about 300 yards from my house. So um, no way. Yeah, so I, I live right at the corner from Mark. Shout out to Mark. Um, I see him walking the dog all the time and uh, yeah, we worked together in Newburgh. I was a teacher in Newburgh um, for seven years before becoming an administrator in a much larger district, Beaverton. But uh, yeah, I know Mark well. Good guy. Great, great administrator. Great, great guy. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. That's wonderful. So I'll actually have to send a, I'll send a copy of our selfie that we just took to Mark and let him know that uh, you're going to be on the show here not too far down the road. So that's awesome. So let's talk a little bit then about that transition. I mean, how does somebody go from being an accountant to being a middle school teacher? I mean, honestly, you ask most middle school teachers, how'd you become a middle school teacher? And they're like, man, I don't know. But here I am. I mean, there's some who are like, oh my God, I just really want to work with middle school kids. I, I taught middle school for five years. I, I loved it. But from accountant to middle school teacher, let's let's yeah. hear a little bit more there, Mike. It's a, it's a yeah, a, a circuitous route for sure. And I was not the type that just was overly excited about working with middle schoolers just because I had no experience with them and I didn't realize how amazing they are. But uh, so, you know, I, I was an English major at Texas A&M, grew up in Texas um, and wanted to travel right after undergrad. So I took a job teaching English as a foreign language in the Czech Republic. So I got to live in Prague for a year, which was amazing and, and get to travel around Central Europe. Um, came back and I loved it. I had a great experience. I was teaching high schoolers, uh, like Czech high schoolers. And uh, moved back to the States, didn't want to be in Texas. So I migrated to the Pacific Northwest. And my plan was to save up some money to go to grad school and get my teaching license and become a teacher. Um, to do that, though, I took an entry level job at a credit union. It was the employee credit union of Intel and Microsoft and Nike, some big employers in this area. And, you know, as happens, a year or two turned into four or five and the company was willing to help me um, go to grad school if I studied business. So. Uh, I decided to take him up on that and got my MBA at Portland State University and um, kind of got deeper into the uh, accounting field and, and focused on finance and innovation management in business school and in uh, transition to working for a, a huge uh, energy firm, the fourth largest energy utility in the world, actually, um, based in Spain. And, and that was a good experience too. I really enjoyed it. Um, huge amount of work, uh, you know, long hours and, and um, some travel and 
which is all fun when you're in your twenties, but you do that for a long enough time and you can start to get a little bit burnt out. And I was getting closer and closer to 30 and I just felt like, you know, I just don't want to spend my life in a spreadsheet. The, the itch to be in the classroom had never really left. So I decided to go back to grad school again. And this was crazy. There was a six month period, I think, where I was working full time. I was a full time project manager, um, which is not a 40 hour a week job. Um, I was co-enrolled in finishing my my business degree um, and then had just started my master's in teaching. So at two different universities. So I go to work all day. And, you know, Tuesday night, I'd go to a corporate finance class or a strategy class. Wednesday night, I'd be at a different university taking like early childhood development um, and then go back to my job the next day and, and do it all over again. So um, it was a crazy time, but just an amazing transition. I, I got done with both degrees. I uh, got a job in Newburgh um, teaching middle school. And I always envisioned myself being a high school teacher, but it was 2010. It was during the recession. Um, it was the job that was available near me. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll give sixth graders a try. So it was sixth grade. And I always thought I'd be like a, a, a high oh, wow. school literature teacher. And I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, but I, I still look back those seven years as a middle school teacher. I think it's the best job I've ever had. It was the most fun I've ever had in my life. Um, just because you're at this age where, you know, enthusiasm is contagious. And if you're excited about something, kids get excited about it. And just being able to build relationships with kids and, uh, focus on, on things that I love, like teaching English and teaching history. Um, I still, to this day have, have thoughts, you know, where the stress of running a company and different things, I think, man, I would love to go back in the classroom. Not that there's not stress there. There's an enormous amount of stress in the classroom, but there's just such a direct connection to kids. Um, it really is. I, I mean, you know, middle school teachers out there, I just, I have an infinite amount of respect for you. Elementary and high school too, of course, but, uh, yeah, it, it has been, will always remain the best job I've ever had. You know, I mentioned too, you know, that I worked for five years as a middle school teacher before going to the high school level as well. I mean, that, that's, that's what I thought I was going to do as I was a science teacher, but you're absolutely right. You know, there's just so much joy every single day working with middle schoolers and, and for a variety of reasons, you know, I mean, just like all kids, they do things that surprise you or maybe, you know, make you take a step back and go, wow, did I really just see that? But they also have this incredible, like, they're in this wonderful transition between being elementary kids who just really want to be teacher pleasers and high school kids who just want to be too cool for the world. And so as they're going through that, and I, I would imagine, you know, with sixth graders, it had to be really great. I had eighth graders, uh, but I also coached seventh and eighth graders. So sure. um, there was just that, I don't know, I can't quite put the right word to it. Um, other than just simply to say there's incredible joy with middle schoolers. Yeah, there's just an electricity in the room that is that is just so palpable. Um, and, you know, it's funny now living, I, I live in the town that I taught in, which is, I, I wasn't at the time, I was living in Portland, commuting down to Newburgh. And now my family has since migrated down to Newburgh because it's a great place to raise a family. And, um, you know, I'll run into my students at the grocery store. They're now working there or they're graduated and see them around town and stuff. I just still have so many high quality relationships with those kids um, because it just is, as you said, it's such a dynamic time in their life. Um, and it's just such a pure time, you know? Um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, if I could, I would go back to the middle school classroom in a heartbeat. Yeah, I I can't say I can't say a single negative word. I mean, I joke about it all the time and, you know, say sometimes, you know, yeah, I served five years at middle school. But the bottom line is middle school is just absolutely amazing. It truly, truly is. So so let's talk about kind of the next steps for you. Uh, I mean, you you mentioned that, you know, you run peer driven PD, but th there's there's some other there's some other time in there, some other steps along the way. Tell us a little bit more about after seven years of middle school, what happens next? Yeah. So, you know, as I think a lot of people get the curiosity of what it would be like to be in the front office. And, um, you know, I had in my time in the corporate world, I did have some leadership opportunities and enjoyed that. And, and um, I had always been looking for ways that I could apply kind of the innovation framework that I learned in business school to what we were doing in buildings. And, and I just wanted a different challenge. So uh, I got my admin license. I became a dean um, of students first and then uh, moved to a, a very large district, as I mentioned before, and became a, uh, an AP 
at um, at a large middle a middle school about a thousand students. And so we had um, the principal and two APs. I was there for a few years. I really loved it. It was you know. I didn't love it as much as teaching, if I'm being honest. Like I, I loved mm -hmm. um, the management side of things, but you just, you just, I mean, as you, as a lot of folks listening to this know, you just deal with a whole different category of stressors in that job. Um, but I wasn't looking to transition out of it. I, it was my third year there, I think, and in February of that year, my boss came to me um, in tears, and it was it was the night of conferences, and I was managing parent teacher conferences. And uh, she closed the door to my office and I thought she was going to give me some really horrible news about some health diagnosis or something like that. And she just said, um, the district is eliminating your position for next year. So we were in a huge budget crisis. We'd had a couple things happen that uh, we were, had like a $15 million shortfall and we were blessed to have two APs. And because I was newer to the district, I was the lowest administrator on the totem pole seniority wise. And she said, you know, uh, I'm sure they'll find a position for you by May. Someone will retire or something. But as of right now, you know, we don't get to have you back in this building. And I was heartbroken because I really loved, you know, I'd built some really good relationships, worked with some amazing teachers, knew the students well. It was a great experience. Um, so I went home that night to my pregnant wife um, and my mother-in-law was staying with us too. So I walk in the door an hour early from conferences. My wife isn't expecting me until much later. And, you know, they're both like, what are you doing home? And I said, well... I kind of just lost my job for next year. And, um, you know, you would think like God has blessed me with an amazing uh, risk taking wife who is brilliant. Um, you would think that there would be a lot of uh, concern and, and trepidation. They both cheered. They both were so excited because I had been talking, you know, behind the scenes for years about all of these ways that I felt like we could uh, streamline things in education, how the private sector could help the public sector. There was a big passion of mine that I thought I would do 20 or 30 years from now. And my wife said, you're never home. You know, you're gone all the time in evenings. Um, she was pregnant with our first child. She was like, my biggest fear has been that you're just not going to be around. Um, and she said, this could be a blessing in disguise. And my, my mother-in-law, who my wife's parents are both very successful entrepreneurs. They built a, a large company in the seventies and, and are still involved with it. They said, we'll back you. Like, I think you should try something new. And so sure enough, the district did right by me and they had a job for me. They had a couple positions they offered me in May. And I politely said, I love you guys, but I'm going to go do something else. I'm going to try this thing. I have to give it a shot. So that's how I transitioned out of the building unexpectedly. It was not my plan that early in my career as a building leader. Um, but it's, it's been great because I still get to work with teachers and administrators all the time. As I said before, it's just a different, it's just a different dynamic and I love it so much. You know, it's interesting, you know, you hear all the time that, you know, good things happen slowly over time and great things happen so quickly. And I, I just, I love that story because, you know, I've, I've talked with so many people who have transitioned, uh, whether it's from education or something else into, into the entrepreneurial field like you and, and, and like myself. And yeah, you just kind of reach those moments where you're like, well, I could do this, but what if I do this? And I, I love how, how your wife was like, yes, this is your opportunity. <laughs> Uh, some parallel a little bit with with my story you know i'm getting ready to leave my superintendency and thinking well let's see you know do i want to go do this do i want to do this i just know i can't keep doing that and my wife's like no wait a minute <laughs> wait a minute you've had this dream to do this here's your chance you gotta go so your wife says you gotta go do this you got somebody you know you got you got family on her side saying hey we'll back you on this where do you go from there? How, how did you figure out how, how to take those first steps and, and what were those first steps? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and this was right before. Well, first of all, shout out to partners and spouses that know us better than ourselves. I'm, I'm a big fan Boy, no of doubt. Marrying, <laughs> marrying way out of my league. My wife is is so much smarter than me and gifted in town. She's also an accountant. Um, so, yeah, the transition uh, <clears throat> was uh you know, there's a little bit of, of trying to having to figure out what was going on and, and what the landscape needed. So I, you know, having the background that I did in, in business school um, and I, I had done a startup with some friends that still 
it's a great company. It's still going. It's a, it's a big brewery here in the Northwest. And so I'd had experience starting something. Um, and the first thing you do is do a lot of research, do a lot of asking questions, asking what people need. And I think the thing that we identified was that, um, you know, 86%, we did this, some independent research, 86% of teachers and administrators agree that the optimal classroom, the optimal professional development comes from full-time classroom teachers. So of course there's room for, um, for specialists. You know, I, I don't necessarily say that the best, um, you know, trauma informed stuff is going to come from a classroom teacher all the time. There's, there's specialists and professors and, and consultants out there to do amazing work in specialized areas, but usually there's a logistical issue that prevents us from having full-time classroom teachers offer a lot of our professional development. And that logistical issue of course, is they're too busy teaching, right? So they're preparing for, um, for their own classes. Uh, they don't necessarily want to, uh, spend a lot of their time prepping to teach their colleagues. And certainly during the summertime, they need a break and that sort of thing. So, you know, I just started thinking, how can we, from an innovation management perspective, kind of look at this in a problem solving sort of way. One of the things they teach in business school is like your success highly depends on your ability to solve problems for people almost exclusively. So how can we solve that problem? That became a huge question of mine. And so in the end, we decided to do kind of like a master class for teachers, if people are familiar with that. So we go out and we film um, the best teachers that we can find. We kind of do a mini documentary and uh, get them on video sharing all of their tips and strategies of what works for them in the classroom every day. And we produce that into online courses that uh, we license to school districts um, that other teachers can take uh, and, and get PD credit for. So. So that was that's where it started was that problem scenario, right? It's like what's needed out there. I talked to a lot of my administrator friends and they're just saying, you know, I would love an easier PD solution. I spend so much of my time thinking about PD and I don't necessarily have the budget to hire consultants to come in all the time. I need a, a more cost conscious uh, solution that teachers actually love because I think, you know, you and I both probably have had experiences where uh, as building leaders where you have some professional development, the teachers are less than enthused about. So the fact that they see themselves oh, yeah. in that product is really, really important to us. Yeah. Well, I think on top of that too, being able to, to create those exemplars of other teachers actually practicing in the classroom, as opposed to just simply having that person in front of you. I mean, it, it, the, the face-to-face -face conversation, obviously, we, we learned a ton about this here over the last couple of years. You can't replace the face-to-face -face conversation. But being able to, you know, learn from practicing classroom teachers, I'm sure has got to be so valuable. What was some of the feedback that you heard? Um, I, I'm sure you had probably... I don't know, like a test group or, you know, maybe, you know, kind of a, like a beta group to give you some feedback as you were putting this together. What was some of the feedback you were hearing about specifically having those exemplar videos? Yeah, that's a great question. I, uh, so we did do a focus group of administrators from 31 states to kind of look through the material as we we're developing it. Um, and the feedback from them was phenomenal. Um, they gave some really helpful feedback along the way of what was going to be useful from an administrative perspective, just in terms of logistics and that sort of thing. But I think what, what we got comments on all the time was the quality of the content. People had gotten so used to Zoom video um, during the pandemic that, you know, we go out with high, high end camera gear and really produce something that, um, you know, kind of has that, uh, that, very finished product feel of a high high end production company, but is also very conversational, right? It's very kind of a give and take. So that was one piece of it. But what's interesting is knowing that teachers oftentimes are very lackluster on certain types of PD. It was really important that this be a very authentic, um, authentic project. And so <laughs> the first thing I did is. I, uh, and if this teacher's listening, she'll, she'll appreciate this because she, she is very self-aware. So I think oftentimes, right in a building, you have a teacher or two who is not afraid to push back. Um, oftentimes in front of staff who is, is the one that's going to raise their hand in a staff meeting and say, why are we doing this? Like, this is a waste of our time. They're just very vocal. And so we had one of these individuals in, in our, uh, in our school. And, and I have a huge amount of respect for her because I think she's brilliant. And I think that she has a lot of great insights. Um, she's also not afraid to make administrators cry. And, you know, <laughs> she's, she's the one that, that is always going to tell you what she thinks. 
Um, and teachers kind of respected her opinion. So I hired her as a consultant and said, I want you to see this product and I want your honest feedback. I want you to tell me what you think because I knew that she would. And so she worked with me in the, in the very formative stages of this because I thought if I can get you to be on board with this and, and have you tell me that this is a product that's worth your time, then any teacher will appreciate it. And she was thrilled with, with what we produced. We will return to the Leaning Into Leadership podcast in just a moment. But first, let me ask you a question. Have you ever said to yourself, man, I should write a book? Well, if you have, then let me ask you another question. What's holding you back? What keeps you from taking the step that moves you from, I have an idea about a book, to, I am a published author? From experience, I would bet it's probably you're wondering who would even want to read a book that I wrote. Maybe you're questioning the idea. Is it unique enough? Is it valid enough? Is it good enough to be a book worthy of having published? Hey, as a best-selling author myself, I can tell you most writers have had the exact same feelings at some point in time during their writing journey. Here at Road to Awesome, we believe in cultivating leaders by elevating voices and promoting positivity. And a part of that work is publishing books for educators by educators. Go to roadtoawesome.net and hit the contact us button to set up a free, no obligation conversation about your book idea. Hey, educators, we've all had incredible experiences. We all have amazing stories and every one of them deserves to be told. Go to roadtoawesome.net, hit the contact us button. Let's have that conversation about your book idea. And now back to the Leaning into Leadership podcast. Uh, that's really powerful. You know, it's making me think back to, you know, those couple of teachers um, as as a building leader and then actually uh, as, a, as a district level leader too. those those two or three teachers that you have who are exactly who you just described. And, you know, it's it feels like that's there's that constant. I got to do everything I can to, you know, to earn their approval or to make sure that they're on board with what I want to do. But boy, when you hear that feedback from them, that that had to be. It had to be like probably the most rewarding piece up to that point to know, hey, <laughs> if she's buying this, people are going to believe believe in this product. What what has the initial um, reaction been to to having that product out there? Yeah, it's been great. So we, you know, one of my favorite, um, you know, we always ask clients for testimonials and stuff just to see and for a lot of feedback because we're constantly learning and growing and evolving. Um, one of the things that I got from an administrator in Colorado, you know, he said, um, he just hit it on the head and, and I have it up on my wall in my office and it says, um, you know, I love this product. We are a, a, a it was one of our first clients. We're a K-12 charter school with a lot of needs um, and a small budget. Um, this product is flexible and relevant to teachers. They love it. And I feel like this is the future of professional development. Um, and that wasn't coerced from me. Um, I got that and I just felt like the future of professional development, like I hope so, because I think something that I'm, I've become very, very passionate about is just centering the conversation on teachers and their professional experience. Because one of the things I learned is that teachers that I, I think I honestly, if I'm being totally honest with myself, underappreciated as a building administrator is the depth of experience of some of our teachers is just phenomenal. Um, and so when I'm working with, uh, a teacher producing this content, they're often saying like, I'm remembering why I love to teach as I do this. Like I'm remembering what I love about this job so much. And to capture that on film is priceless. And when I talk to administrators, I think they're, they're it does a couple things. They're relieved to have a product that, that they're not shy about putting in front of their um, teachers. And, uh, you know, oftentimes what we do these days is we go out and we help school districts to produce content featuring their own teachers. So we'll go to a district, we'll work with them, we'll help identify some really good teachers that they kind of want to clone in their district um, and then uh, capture that on camera and provide that to them as professional development. And, you know, what I've heard from like superintendents is that it's a huge morale boost. Like their teachers seeing their colleagues featured on this platform that's that's well regarded and is growing fast. And um, they just feel like our teachers have something to offer. 
right? Like, and like I was just talking with the district last week, that's like a 2000 student district. They're on the smaller side and they were so excited to have the conversation about potentially being featured on here because again, amazing teachers live in every single corner of the country um, in every size district and, and just having the ability to pull out, um, you know, the, the, the real tangible um, gold that's inside of some of your teachers. Um, there's just nothing better than that. Like I just walk away from those interactions, those, those film days and stuff like that, just feeling like this was again um, for the 20th, 30th time, like one of the best days I've ever had working with educators. That's incredible. I mean, what, what an incredible way to uh, both intentionally and unintentionally for, for school and district leaders to just continue to build that culture, uh, build that, you know, that, that culture of excellence, if you will, by lifting up some of the individuals right there within their building, within their district. I think sometimes you, you said something a couple of minutes ago, basically, and, and I'll paraphrase because I didn't quite capture it all, but you said that you kind of overlooked or took for granted um, the depth of experience that teachers have. And I wasn't able to capture the whole thing because it, it forced me to stop and just think. Because I think, I don't think, I know I did the exact same thing. You know, so many incredibly gifted teachers that I've had the opportunity to teach next, you know, teach alongside to, you know, work with as a building principal and to work with as a superintendent. Oftentimes, I think when we're putting together professional development plans, where we fall short, and this is why this is so important, this, this type of professional development is so important, is we do the opposite of what we want teachers to do in the classroom, which is we just paint the whole thing with one broad brush instead of meeting every teacher where they are and help them to identify their needs. Uh, as a superintendent working alongside my, um, my instructional coach, we were working really hard and going deep into that really specific individual teacher driven professional development where everybody had an opportunity to focus on their own work. Talk to me and, and really talk to our, our listeners around how does a district sit down with you and say, all right, here's where we are. Here's where we want to go. How, how do you put a plan together? How do you have that conversation? Yeah, no, again, a great question. Um, so, you know, what I, the way that we have always done it, and it can look different depending on the district's needs. So a lot of times we go into a district and they say, you know, I talked with someone last week again, who was saying, we really want to focus on, um, you know, work like clearly linking things to standards. And so we can, we can have that conversation. We can identify a teacher. If they have a topic they want to address, we can say, okay, well, let's, let's talk about um, what teachers in your district are doing that really well. And usually I'm talking to a superintendent and I'll say, I want to have a 10 minute conversation with a couple of your principals and help articulate, you know, what we're looking for. Cause they're the ones that are in the classroom seeing what's going right. on. Right. And so that's one way that we can identify an individual. Um, one of the ways that I really like doing it, and I think that we've had the most success is that, um, you know, I'll, I'll talk to an administrator, building administrator or a district or a um, district administrator and say, all right, so who is that teacher, um, those three or four teachers that you would just love to clone, right? That if you could yeah. um, have 15 of them, you know, you would just love it. And I go and meet with that teacher and I say, what are you passionate about? What is the topic that you read about on your own time? Um, what is something that uh, you are learning a lot about currently and are really growing in? And I have found that some of the best PD comes from teachers talking about things that they're very passionate about. Like there's no way uh, to, to match the quality of, of um, learning that comes from that because, I mean, it's just like with students, right? Like you have to entice them with um, some motivation, something that they're naturally interested in. And it just, you can't fabricate that motivation anywhere, right? It, it's just so innate. And so a lot of what we do is identify those teachers that are amazing and then talk to them about what they're passionate about. The real challenging thing and the real fun thing is a lot of times teachers that are that good, they don't always know um, what they're doing is so special or they don't always know how to articulate uh, kind of what their secret sauce is, so to speak. So 
a lot of times it's me observing them and then I'll come in and ask them about a million questions. You know, I've done this a lot. And so me or someone from my team will come in and, and sit down with them and um, really hash through like the, the technical details of a lesson or the technical details of a, of a, of a piece of teaching um, because that's what's useful to people, right? We, we kind of go broad and we go deep. So we talk about their background. We talk about what they love about teaching. We talk about, you know, for lack of a better word, their why. I don't, I don't love that for some specific reasons that I could get into, but we talk about their motivation and, and how much they care about kids because that is a good reminder to them about why they're doing all of this. And then we go deep into, okay, practically, like I want to get into the weeds here and talk about how do you do this in your classroom? How could another teacher approach the same problem and come away with success? So, um, yeah, to answer your question in a roundabout way, a lot of times it's just taking the time to go really deep with a gifted teacher and try to pull that out and articulate it. It takes a little bit of time. Usually we go in and we work with a teacher. We have like one full release day where we just sit down and, and work with the teacher one on one or two on one or three on one. Um, and then we have another day for filming. So it doesn't take weeks like we can we can get everything done in two full days. Um, but we have just done this enough times that we know there's no shortcuts to it. There's no five question questionnaire that a teacher fills out and we can just hit record. Uh, we have to really sit down and get into the weeds and, and ask them a whole bunch of questions. And then we kind of help codify that into something that's going to be useful for a, a broader audience. So I'm sure that that's great learning for, for you and your team. I'm sure it's great learning for that individual teacher as well. And ultimately it leads to great learning for other teachers, but what might be something in that process, because that's such a deep process that you learn that maybe administrators should know about their teachers that maybe they don't know, or maybe some ways they can leverage those skills that other teachers have. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I think a lot about that I, I think a lot about, I reflect a lot about how I would do things differently now, given my, um, my time with teachers one-on-one, -on -one, um, versus when I was in a building, like, what would I go back and tell myself as, as an administrator? And I think, again, admitting just in a vulnerable way to myself that, um, you know, I think that I wish that I just would have spent a little more time asking my teachers for help um, on specific things. And so one of the things I'll tell, I, I'm not a consultant, I'm not a coach, like I don't, I haven't been in the, in the, in the um, I mean, I'm a consultant in the way that I help schools build professional development, but I'm not a coach. I'm not here to, to work with administrators because I don't have 30 years of experience. But I think the one thing that I, well, one of the few things that I've uh, realized that I tell administrators, because oftentimes in this process, when we're identifying an amazing teacher, a lot of times what happens is they're so committed to what they do that they're also kind of facing a little bit of burnout. And they're like, I love this teacher so much. Um, but they're just so devoted to it that I worry about them sometimes, right? And so what I tell them, and, and this has gotten um, great response, is, okay, we need to appreciate our teachers as the experts that they are, right? So I have a good friend who is a, um, who's a surgeon, and he went through um, you know, medical school. He went through a, a really well-regarded fellowship. He literally does surgeries on newborn babies. He's an amazing guy. He's so brilliant. And, you know, obviously people that ask his advice hang on every word that he says because it's a matter of life and death. And I'm not overstating it when I say I have sat down with some teachers that have the same level of technical proficiency in teaching that he does at his job. Like they're that quality of professionals. And we have these people around us all the time because teaching is not one of those jobs um, that you move on from and get promoted out of three or four years after starting it, like so many jobs in the private sector, you know, you do a good job, you get promoted and you're doing something different two years from now. Teaching is one of those fields where you have teachers that have been doing the same thing, despite the changes in education over the years for 30 years sometimes. And they have had the, the time to hone their craft to really, really perfect it. Um, and so what I tell administrators to do in those situations where they feel like they have a teacher, one of those rock star teachers or any teacher really that's starting to falter or starting to, um, to it just needs a boost and morale, go to them, go to their classroom. Don't call them to your office, go into their space um, because going to them is a sign of respect, right? I'm not calling you to come talk to me. I'm going to go to you 
and sit down with them with a real problem that you have, um, whether it's working with a student, whether it's solving an instructional issue, um, and ask them for their advice. Don't ask them for their feedback. The word advice is very important. This, is a, this has been studied where advice is much more neutral than feedback. You ask for someone's feedback and they feel obligated to be diplomatic because they think they have to give something that's positive and negative and then positive, you know, that feedback sandwich kind of thing. Advice is just like, hey, someone's asking me for my opinion. I feel free to give them my thoughts. Um, and then use that, take their advice if you can to help solve that problem. There is nothing that's more validating or that's more of um, a mood boost professionally than helping someone to solve a problem. I'm sure that you've experienced that um, with your with the work that you do with administrators. Um, oh, when yeah. you're able to help someone solve a problem, you just feel like I am doing what I was meant to do. And teachers are doing that all the time with students, but they often don't feel that recognition from administrators. Even though I think we have a great administrators who appreciate their teachers, I'm not saying anything other than that, but I wish I would have slowed down enough to move beyond just the, how you doing today, Mrs. Jennings? How was your weekend? To really sitting down with someone and say, I have this issue and I, and I feel like you might have a part of the answer because you're really good at what you do. And I, I want to, will you help me? Can you give me some advice on this? It's a game changer. It really is. Uh, super powerful is what it is. Uh, again, I, I love this conversation, Mike, because each time you're talking, I, I'm finding myself reflecting on different moments over the course of my leadership career, you know, where either I did something similar to that or, oh, man, that would have been a really, really good way to handle a particular situation. Just some absolute gold nuggets of leadership advice uh, right there. I really appreciate that so much. So, Mike, let's go ahead. We're going to we're going to transition into, I guess, basically our last two questions. Um, so uh, here on Leaning Into Leadership, I ask everybody the same final question, which is, how are you leaning into leadership? So, Mike, how are you leaning into leadership right now? Yeah, it's uh, so I'm a big fan of Patrick Lencioni, if you're familiar with his work. And, um, you know, he has a, a saying, you know, stay hungry, humble and smart. And I always think about that. Um, and, you know, I think having humility in the work we do is really important. Um, I, I've learned that, you know, when you do well in a job early in your career. Like I had some really good accolades early in my private sector career and stuff. And, and in my mid twenties, I thought it was, I thought it was something special, you know, I thought pretty highly of myself. And then you get to be a little bit older and you start realizing, okay, there's a lot that I don't know. And since I've had this job where I basically interview teachers full time, and then I talk with um, district leaders a ton, I've just learned that other people have so much insight to offer. Um, and it's really changed my perspective on life where every conversation I have, I, I kind of go into it thinking like this person has something to share with me. And so, um, I get to lean into leadership all the time because I get to talk to amazing leaders all the time and ask them really deep questions and take hours to, to hear their stories and hear their insights and stuff. So I, I, I mean, I talked about wanting to go back to the middle school classroom. I still would do that. I love it. But if I'm being honest, I do feel like I've somehow created the best job in the world for myself. I really love it a lot. Um, so yeah, I'd say that I'm also an avid reader. I love, I love reading, um, books about leadership and, and, uh, actually historical books about leadership that, um, those are awesome influences on me too. That's outstanding. I love that, man. That's, that's, that's such an awesome answer. So for, for my listeners now who are thinking, huh, I need to know more about peer driven PD. This, this has really, you know, kind of sparked an interest in my mind. How do they get in touch with you? Um, what, what's the best way for them to reach out and connect with you? Yeah, sure. Great. Thanks. So you can go to peerdrivenpd.com. Um, all of our information is there. Um, you know, if folks are interested in working with us, they can go to the, you know, get a quote button on there and it'll send us a message to someone on my team and we'll get back to you pretty quick. Um, anybody, you know, I, I, this isn't, um, you know, a, a sales tactic or something like that. Like if you're not interested in, in our services, but you just have questions for me, I, I love talking with administrators. So you can email me directly at Mike at peer driven PD.com and I'll get back to you. Um, yeah. So check us out. Um, love to talk with you more. And again, even if you're not looking for, you know, some of the products that we develop, but you just want to brainstorm how to, you know, I've had people reach out to me and say, um, 
you know, I just, I need to find a way to do differentiated PD with my staff. That's a big question that we get. Um, I, I've had that conversation a lot and uh, I love talking through it. So I'll hop on a Zoom call with you for free. Like you don't have to buy anything. I'd love to chat with you for, um, you know, 30, 30 minutes, 60 minutes and then see if, if we can help you out. That's awesome. I'll make sure that uh, all of Mike's contact information and the links and those types of things are in the show notes so that uh, listeners, you have an opportunity to connect with Mike. Mike, thank you so much for coming on Leaning Into Leadership. Man, I really enjoyed this conversation and appreciate all the great stuff that you brought to the table. This is a lot of fun, Darren. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, hopefully we get to talk again soon. Just a genuinely awesome conversation with Mike. I hope that you were able to find a handful of gold nuggets in there. Um, Definitely all kinds of great stuff there. And be certain to check out the work that Mike is doing with Peer Driven PD. I think it's such a unique way to approach professional development that is maybe a little bit different than what so many of us typically will do. Definitely, we want to lean on those expert teachers that we have. But wow, this is a really exciting and different way to go about doing that. So make sure that you reach out to Mike. His contact information is in the show notes. And now it's time for a pep talk. For today's pep talk, I want to go back into Mike's interview and go directly at two things that he said. Number one, that 86% of administrators and teachers think that the best professional development comes from classroom teachers. And the second element was when he talked about as a school leader, he felt like he overlooked or took for granted the depth of teacher expertise that he had in his building. Folks, we cannot do that. We cannot overlook the incredible power the incredible expertise, the incredible skill that our teachers have in our buildings each and every day. I'm not saying don't bring people in from the outside to help support your teachers and support your staff. I mean, that's part of what I do for a living. But what I am saying is lean on your expert teachers. They are highly skilled, highly trained, and highly passionate about the work that they do. This is the time of year when we already start to think about what might we do for next year? What are the things we can do to get us from the return of the holiday break into testing season? I would tell you one of those things is go lean on those teachers. Talk to them. Ask their opinion. Really put them in the driver's seat because they have the skills, they have the knowledge, they have the passion. All they're waiting for is the opportunity. So make sure you give those teachers the opportunity to genuinely display all of that expertise. Thank you for joining me this week on Leaning Into Leadership. Get out there and have a road to awesome day. Thank you for listening to the Leaning Into Leadership podcast brought to you by Road to Awesome. Don't forget, click subscribe, give a review, and share this with somebody who might also enjoy leaning into leadership.